and my friend who was um, a co-dance captain with me was talking about it. He said, are you going to work on the Spider-Man show? And I said, the what? It was a powerful property. The, you know, the eyes of the world were upon the Spider-Man. And it seemed like it was constant drama from that jump off point. It hasn't even opened yet, but there has been another accident for the most expensive Broadway musical ever. From the creator of Politics Weekly. Not only can the actors get hurt, but the audience can get hurt. You know, a death might occur right in front of you. Does whatever a spider can, the story of the Spider-Man musical. Featuring a special appearance from Ben Brantley. Now available wherever you listen to podcasts. Hey everyone, welcome to Politics Weekly. Politics Weekly is a weekly nonpartisan podcast featuring some of the biggest names in politics and portraying some of the biggest political stories of the week through both left and right leaning lenses. Hosted by award winning journalist Nolan Cleary, the e- former editor in chief of the Hudsonian newspaper, Politics Weekly has been listened to by over 15,000 people worldwide. The views expressed by guests on our show are not necessarily the views expressed by the host, Nolan Cleary. All right, everyone, welcome back to Politics Weekly. I'm your host, as always, Nolan Cleary. And this week we have a very special guest. He's a student activist and a student at Cornell University, Mr. Zion Sharon. Thank you for joining me, Zion. Thanks for having me, Nolan. I really appreciate it. Appreciate you coming on. So let's let's jump right into the stories. So recently, CNN had a town hall with former President Donald Trump running to be president again in 2024. This is the first time in eight years that Donald Trump has been on CNN or has had been on a town hall on CNN. And this town hall was hosted by Caitlin Collins, a contributor to CNN. And the debate was nothing short of interesting. Donald Trump, President Trump, went on to mock E. Jean Carroll, who is a journalist that recently won a lawsuit in New York City, claiming that he had sexually assaulted her and that He had defamed her. She won that lawsuit in New York City. Trump is, as of the current moment, he is appealing that lawsuit, but he made fun of her, made fun of her dog's name, made fun of a number of aspects. He talked about a number of issues. He talked about how he, if he gets back in the White House, he plans to pardon many of the individuals that were convicted in associated with the riot that occurred at the Capitol on January 6, 2021. And in addition to that, he also mocked Caitlin Collins, saying that she was, quote, nasty town hall for her questioning of him. What were your thoughts on that CNN town hall with President Trump? It did seem a little bit like a debate to me. Um, She did go back at the statements that he said. Um, That said, I do know that at the end, uh, he says something to the crowd, says they love him and everything. And he looks at her and he goes, "Uh, that was a great job. And I I actually think she did a phenomenal job, um, given that it's CNN having a Republican on. And I'm not just saying that as a, uh, you know, insult towards CNN. I think the same could be said if a Democratic candidate was on Fox News. Um, They'd have their own personal biases. And I'm aware of that. I think that overall, though, she did a phenomenal job. I think that when it came to uh, some of the things she did, uh, uh, you know, skew stuff so that it sounded a certain way. Um, One of the things that I think stood out to me was uh, the 52 miles of new wall put up. Uh, And I think it's a good point. If something's replaced from something that's not working to something that is, that should count towards, you know, the total count. I just think that makes sense. Just seems logical to me. Um, and then as far as stuff like uh, the January 6th riots, I think it was interesting um, just to see like how uh, they they referenced it and how Trump did seem to want to back down too much from, you know, his uh, support of individuals coming to the Capitol or his support of what he claims was only the peaceful part of the protests, uh, not the 
more uh, violent side uh, that did occur in, with a small number of the protesters, or in my opinion, those people went from protesters to rioters. This town hall has received a lot of mixed reactions from both sides, specifically Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, New York Congresswoman, has condemned CNN. She has argued that they gave a platform to Donald Trump, which she argues is harmful. But other people have disagreed with that. Anderson Cooper, who is a host on CNN, defended CNN's decision to host the town hall with Donald Trump, though he did condemn many of the things that President Trump said at the town hall. What are your thoughts on the debate over whether this town hall was a good idea or that or, or, or whether Trump should be given a platform. What are your thoughts on that debate? So I think everyone should have um, some sort of town hall meeting. In my opinion, I think every uh, candidate who's being seriously considered, uh, which means anyone who like officially has uh, announced that they're running for, you know, a nomination of Republican or Democratic Party or even an uh, independent who has some level of backing. I know occasionally we get some of those independents that no one's ever heard of. But for those that actually have, you know, some sort of following, I think it's important because, you know, more information just helps voters vote educated. And if you want to get educated information, I think uh, a lot of times news has started to get to the point where instead of sharing what the people said, they share their opinions on one line. Uh, for instance, the CNN thing, I unfortunately was not able to see it live. I did go back and see the recording of it. But when I looked it up, uh, the majority of uh, stuff that came up on YouTube, uh, I, I hope it's okay to reference other platforms while I'm on here, but um, the ones that I was looking up on YouTube, uh, they all were commentary. It was always a quick line and then everyone else's opinion. I finally saw the actual just what Trump had to say. And I feel like it's important to hear it right, uh, as old saying goes, right from the horse's mouth. So I think that uh, giving a platform um, unless the platform is directly calling for some sort of violence, which in my opinion, nothing that he said ever referenced any sort of violence or, you know, came after any one group. I feel like as long as it's not calling for violence of any group, uh, there should be more of a platform. I think with people like um, AOC, when she referenced, uh, you know, being upset at CNN, I think they're just worried that uh, people are going to start seeing uh, Trump in a more favorable light. I actually watched uh, the the town hall a couple of times and I've watched it sometimes with um some of my democratic friends they vote uh democrat and I as an independent who leans a little bit right have different opinions but some of the stuff they were like wow that was actually a really good point and I think when you give someone the time to have long content platforms they're able to explain themselves more and I think uh some some people of congress are a little bit of concerned that they're going to have Donald Trump up there and explain uh his points I don't think he did a great job in every aspect, but I think overall he must have done a great job. Otherwise, AOC wouldn't have uh, had a comment if she thought that Trump completely did terribly, because then she would have been like, oh, look at CNN. They made Trump look terrible. I'm so happy. Um, so I think she actually indirectly gave uh, Trump a compliment, uh, the stronger one that I would have given him possibly. But um, that's my take on it, is that there always should be a platform for anyone because it educates uh, the American voters. And as long as it's not uh, causing direct hate, which I don't think anything said there uh, could be tied to uh, her hate of, or harassment of a specific group, um, I think that it's fine. All right. With that being said, let's move on to the next story. So recently, Florida Governor Ron Santos headed to Iowa for a fundraiser along with his PAC Never Back Down, which was started by him to try and spread some of his conservative policy ideas. DeSantis gave a speech and went to the fundraiser with Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds, a Republican. Despite Reynolds introducing Ron DeSantis, she declined to offer a 2024 presidential endorsement. Of course, Iowa is the state which will host uh, the first Republican caucus in 2024. Historically, since 1976, when Jimmy Carter won the Democratic primary, historically, that has been the state where both parties on the same night uh, have their first caucus, and that's kind of considered the beginning of primary season. However, this year, Democrats will be breaking from tradition as the Michigan uh, state primary will be preceding 
the Iowa caucuses, but Republicans will still be holding their Iowa caucuses first. DeSantis has not yet announced whether he will run for president of the United States, though he is expected to announce in the next month or so. DeSantis is considered a one of the leading candidates in the 2024 Republican primary and is considered the chief challenger to President Donald Trump in his quest to clinch the 2024 Republican presidential nomination. DeSantis in recent weeks has fallen behind in polling. According to Real Clear Politics, President Donald Trump has more than a 30 point advantage over DeSantis in primary polling. However, DeSantis still has a decisive uh, second place lead over Mike Pence, who is the third place person in polling right now. How do you think DeSantis's fundraiser went? Many people have obviously speculated that this is him further hinting at a 2024 bid. How do you think it went? Do you think it went well? Do you think it went poorly? And what does DeSantis need to do to catch up to Trump in polling? Yeah, so I think he did something really smart. I think he tied himself really well to another popular governor. I think what he did is he talked about how Florida has been doing so well. Um, to be honest, I didn't do a ton of, uh, I didn't like watch any of his, uh, you know, announcements or anything like that. Um, I did my typical follow up. I actually read an NPR article and there's a quote in there. Um, and I, I'm not going to be able to quote it exactly because it's off the top of my head. But basically, it was this uh, one uh, woman who's saying that her grandkids go to Florida and they're in the education system down there and that Florida is doing something right. And then he also said um, in his debate and he said something like my I can't remember, but basically summing it up is my people keep an eye over here and see what this governor is doing. And we make sure that we're not falling behind. And I think that was really good because it shows that he's complimenting, you know, a governor in a state that's very well liked. Uh, Reynolds is very, very well liked by the Republicans there. And I think that uh, the idea is if he ties himself to her. They are able to uh, they're able to, you know, have this connection um, that makes it look like, OK, so I I'm tied to this person. You like this person. Come out and vote for me. Um, that said, as far as catching up to Trump, um, this is a little bit of a out there take, but I actually don't think DeSantis is planning to have a chance of winning 2024. Um, I think he might run. So what I think is going on is uh, when Trump ran in 2020, you know, he had a lot of money in his campaign bank at the end from people backing him and everything like that. And I think what DeSantis is doing is I think DeSantis is very smart. I think he's one of the smartest politicians that I've seen in a long time. I think he's very well educated. Um, and I think he knows what he's doing. So I think what he's looking to do is if he says that he's running, he's, like you said, the clear second runner. He's the only one who would have a chance against Trump. Uh, if he announces that he's going to run, he uh, will be able to get a lot of the never Trumper Republicans or even never Trumper Democrats and independents to give him a lot of money in fundraising, thinking, OK, this is the one chance that we have to beat Trump. Because the truth is, if Trump runs against Biden, I think they're worried that Trump would beat Biden. So they're like, let's just stop that scenario from ever happening and make sure that Trump doesn't run. Uh, after he gets a lot of his his funding, I think that he'll probably back down, um, endorse Trump and then run 2028. Um, I don't think that anyone can really come up with a way that uh, Donald Trump isn't going to win the primaries. I think that overall, he has a pretty good grip of the Democratic Party. Uh, there's still a large group of people that think the election was stolen from him. Those who don't believe the election was stolen from him, I think a lot of them uh, that grew up, even young individuals, especially young individuals that just were entering the workforce, those who would be like, you know, 26, 28 now, um, those people saw an economy that was really good before. And now an economy where people are getting laid off. Um, I'm a college senior. I'm graduating soon. And, uh, you know, two, three years ago uh, when I was when I was a freshman, I never talked to anyone who was, um, or well, I guess a sophomore. I did talk to anyone that I knew that was a senior who was graduating and didn't have a job lined up for them. Uh, now it's uh, about half of my friends don't have work lined up for them and they're still looking. So I think that says a lot about the economy. And I think that uh, overall, people are going to be voting Trump in the Republican primaries. And DeSantis doesn't have a, a true chance, but he's still going to run just for fundraising reasons. All right. With that being said, let's move on to the next story. 
So former New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani is being sued for $10 million. This is over multiple allegations of misconduct, including sexual harassment and assault. The lawsuit is coming from Noel Dunphy, who was an employee of Giuliani's and also a lawyer for former President Donald Trump. Giuliani's team has denied the allegations. What are your thoughts on the allegations? So um, I didn't do a, a ton of research on this, but what I did see is basically uh, it seems like uh, he's being sued by her uh, about, you know, tr trying to be in a somewhat of a sexual relationship and also that he didn't pay her a deferred salary or he, he paid her. He didn't pay her the deferred salary because he said he was going to wait for it until uh, there was a finalized divorce, I believe. I read that in uh, one of the articles that I was reading. Um, overall, I feel like. Well, I feel like if it was him paying someone for, for sex, um, that's a, a crime. And I feel like in this country, we have to start um, seeing a little bit more of people uh, having a difference between uh, civil and criminal cases. I feel like it's very rare that I find a criminal case that also should be a civil case. I feel like if what he did was um, true, that he tried to pay someone for sex, he should be charged uh, uh, for a crime and uh, because it's not legal in the state of New York. Um, and if he can't get charged for a crime, then I don't think he should be charged civilly. Uh, that said, that if, if he broke a law um, and we decide to enforce those laws, then I think that it's important that, uh, you know, he uh, he pay up, uh, not he pay up, he, uh, he spend, pay his time. So it, to me, it's, I guess what I'm saying is if he broke a law and offered to pay to have sex with someone, he broke a law. He should be charged in a federal, not federal, in a criminal capacity. And if he did not do that and you don't have enough food for that, um, I feel like what he did wouldn't be wrong. Um, that said, if he did offer her um, a salary and he did not pay her, um, I think that that would be something that she could sue for, for damages. Um, but I do think the, you know, $10 million, I don't think that he ever offered to pay her $10 million unless she was a lifetime employee and who would work for someone for a lifetime and not get paid. I think uh, it was like a year before uh, she left. So that's that's my personal personal opinion. I think there's a lot of allegations behind um, her just saying stuff that he did, like that he uh, would ha go on rants and say racist or anti-Semitic or um, stuff like that. That's just like sexist and everything. Um, and I feel like that may or may not be true. Uh, but whether it's a case or not, in my opinion, they'll have to prove that he uh, that he broke a law. And I don't think that. Um, I don't know. It just it also surprises me a little bit because New York, um, a lot of the Democrats here will uh, say uh, for those who are listening who aren't in New York, New York, I think, is one of the more pro uh, sex worker states where they think that sex work should become legal and that people should be able to pay to uh, for prostitution and pay for sex work. Um, and if that's true, I don't see what he did would be wrong, um, given given what I've seen. That said, I might be missing something that uh, is a key part to this puzzle. Um, if there's something that I, uh, you know, alluded to that uh, wasn't there, please let me know. Um, but that's just kind of my take is that he uh, did something that was a little sketchy, a little shady, and he should have to pay her the salary he agreed to, and they should drop this and not have it go to court unless he actually has a criminal case and then he should be tried criminally, not civilly. All right. So let's uh, get into the next story. So President Donald Trump was recently uh, sued successfully in the New York Supreme Court in Manhattan for battery and defamation. Uh, the jury uh, ruled that Trump was liable for damages against E. Jean Carroll, who was a former journalist and uh, or a or a journalist and a former columnist. Uh, what are your thoughts on Trump uh, being found uh, to have committed these charges? So I actually have very strong strong thoughts on everything related to defamation. So in order for defamation to be proven um, for a you know, public figure, you have to prove that the statements were said to hurt the person's image, and they were said intentionally with that with that point. Um, so I think the first question is, is she a public or is she a private figure? If she is a private figure, which the average American citizen is, um, you know, the defamation, proving defamation is a little bit easier. 
Um, that said, if you look at it, she went and she made public statements and she got herself in the public eye. She went out of her way to make herself go into the public eye with these allegations. So in my opinion, um, the fact that she's in several articles that you can look up her name and you just know who she is because she's put herself really out there. And mind you, too, these articles are like national uh, articles. Um, I would say that she's a public figure. Uh, once you assume that she's a public figure, she made an allegation uh, that Trump raped her, right? Um, Trump said that the whole story was fake, and now she's suing him for the defamation of him saying that it was fake. Um, in my opinion, the, the court decided that uh, he did not rape her, that he assaulted her, right? And that he should not be charged by rape charges. So if they're saying that he didn't rape someone, and she goes out there and says, he raped me, and the courts say that he did it. In my opinion, she's the one who has defamation. She went out of her way to say that a man raped her and the court saying that it didn't happen. Now, I know the courts aren't always accurate, but that's, you know, how we're working within the confines of the law. That said, um, afterward, he kind of made fun of her and stuff like that. And people are saying that he did that intentionally to hurt her image. Uh, I would have a counterpoint, and I think that this will happen when it's appealed, is that he wasn't trying to hurt her image. He was trying to protect his own. When someone comes out with a public allegation, you have all rights to defend yourself. If in the defense, you make the other person look bad, um, I don't think that's defamation. I feel like that's just him defending himself and her being upset that it hurt her image along the process. But if his, um, if it wasn't his intent to hurt her, and that's not why he did it, um, then I don't think she has a defamation case that I do think it will be overturned. Um, so that's that's my opinion is that she is a public figure. He was defending himself and that it wasn't malicious to attack her. It was, uh, you know, self-defense, self-preservation. And there's nothing in defamation that says that you can't uh, defend oneself and protect your own your own name. So I don't think that it should, will hold up uh, if appealed. All um, right. Well, let's move on to the next story. So Representative George Santos, a New York Republican in Congress was recently indicted by the Justice Department for on 13 counts for a number of charges from wire fraud, money laundering, theft of public funds, and making false statements to the United States House of flipping from blue to red in Long Island. However, the North Shore Leader, an independent newspaper in Long Island, discovered that Santos uh, had lied about a number of things from where he went to school to many of the jobs he had obtained, and, as well as some of his wealth as well. Santos also lied about being a producer on the musical Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark. Santos was investigated by the U.S. Department of Justice, and he was indicted on these 13 federal count indictments. Santos has pleaded not guilty. However, many in Congress are not buying it. Robert Garcia, a Democratic congressman from California, introduced a resolution this week to expel Santos from the United States House of Representatives. If Santos is successfully expelled, he will be the first ever congressman since Jim Traficant an Ohio Democrat in 2002 to officially be expelled from the United States House of Representatives. What are your thoughts on this indictment and what are your thoughts on the potential for Santos to be expelled from Congress? Well, honestly, I think he's made both Democrats and Republicans and our entire political system kind of look like, you know, a bunch of idiots. The fact of the matter is he convinced a whole bunch of people that he should be the Republican nominee and no Republican politician while he was running figured out, hey, I'm running against this guy or, oh, I don't like this guy. Let me do a background check. And um, then we have, on the other hand, of a Democrat, you know, like you said, he flipped his, his district. He has a, a, de a Democratic district. He can't beat a guy who is making up everything just out of thin air as he goes along. So I think it's very interesting from that perspective that, you know, this individual goes out there and just makes up everything and gets elected. Um, 
And then it comes down to the question of should he be able to hold a seat even though he did that? Um, I think that it's a interesting line because I feel like for a lot of politicians, politicians as a whole, I feel like lie a lot to get into the positions that they have. I don't have the most favorable view on politicians as a whole. I think there, there are very good politicians out there that I, I would be happy to say that they have good character. Um, but I don't think that's the majority. I think it's more of a sizable minority of politicians. So he goes out there and he lies about a lot of things. And uh, now should he be removed for that? I feel like the American people voted him in. If he didn't great, if he didn't do anything that was illegal, um, I mean, I don't know if lying about how much money you're worth is illegal. Everyone does it. I mean, uh, Trump had a statement that he was worth ten billion, and then Forbes came out and said he was worth three point something billion years ago. Does that make him eligible to be removed? I feel like a lot of people um lie about different aspects. Um, so I feel like just because he lied, at the end of the day, the people in his district district voted him in. Um, to be honest, I don't think that people should be able to, on a federal level, remove people um, very easily because I think that it should be the people in their district that do it. And if the House of Representatives were to, you know, remove this this individual, every single district except the people that voted him in would have a say. And in America, we have districts for a reason, and each people in their districts are able to have. Um, you know, those people represent them, a representative from each group, and they'd have every other district in America. Every other district in America would be able to have a say in what this district's representative stays or goes. So I, I don't know how it works because I haven't looked into it enough, but I wish there was a way where instead of recalling him through all the other districts having a say, they could do a recall kind of like they tried in California, where they could put out something for petitions. And if enough people signed it and voted for it, he could have a special election and recall him. Um, but I don't think that it makes a lot of sense from a uh, representative perspective to have every other representative in America, every other district in America, have a say in what happens to this district's representative and not the people themselves. Um, so I know it's a very interesting, interesting perspective, um, but that's where I stand is, do I think that he should have been elected? No. Do I think he should still be in office? No. But I also don't think that other districts should be the one to pull him back. I think that it should be, a, there should be a way that his own district can. If his own district still wants him in there after all his lives, well, that's the representative they picked. And we have to honor that because that's how America is. Well, with that being said, let's move on to the next story. So the state of North Carolina recently passed a 12-week abortion ban. The ban passed the state house and state senate Despite this, the ban was vetoed by the Democratic governor, Roy Cooper. Cooper held a rally where he officially vetoed the bill. However, Republicans in November gained a supermajority in the state legislature. And as a result, they were able to overturn the veto. What are your thoughts on the fact that they were able to overturn this veto? And what are your thoughts on abortion now being illegal after 12 weeks in the state of North Carolina? Well, um, just to clarify, too, I think uh, before it was 20 weeks, so it got pushed back by eight weeks. Um, I think that the pro-life community has seen this as a huge win. Um, as far as my thoughts on it, uh, I think abortion is a very hot topic. Um, I think that to me, something that I will say publicly and I think is important for uh, everyone is to make sure that we're putting the safety of a woman first. Um, so if there's ever a period where a woman's you know life is at danger because of someone they're carrying, no matter when in the pregnancy they have, there's no um, you know there's no moral high ground in telling someone that they have to risk their life to save another person. Um, I think if some if a woman decides she wants to do that, that's that's her decision, and uh, and she can do that. And I don't think anyone should force her to have an abortion either way. Um, but I don't think I would be uh, forcing women to have a pregnancy when it could result in in their uh, you know in their death. I don't think that there's anywhere in America where we've ever forced people, with possibly the exception of of drafts. When we draft people, we say we're drafting you and you might die in order to protect our our country and other people in it. Um, that said, um, I think it's very interesting just how our how our country works, where or how states work, where 
a group of people can get elected in one one house, right? Or and then the governor can decide that they don't agree with it. I think it will be really interesting to see how this affects the governor's chance of re-election. Uh, will this increase their chances of getting re-elected because they took a a pro-abortion uh, stance, or at least I, uh, you know, wanted to not push that uh, twenty-week to twelve-week mark? Um, that said, I do think that it's. Um, I think that I appreciate the fact that you know that they were able to overturn it outside of abortion, um, regardless of the topic. Um, I very much like when I see you know a house being able to overturn a veto because a veto is one person that's elected to represent the entire state. Um, this goes for federal level as well, where there's one president, right? And I feel like we elect one president and that president is going to have a ton of topics that we elect them for. And that if they have one issue that they disagree with the general population and they decide to veto it, if the general population supports the original bill and the governor or president goes out there and vetoes it, I think that it's great that we have a system where we can say, no, a super majority of the people support this. Now, if the majority of North Carolina voters don't support the the bill moving to 12 weeks, um, I think what they'll do is they won't vote those Republicans back into office. And then it will go from a super majority to a minor majority or not a majority out of the whole. Um, so I think it will be really interesting to see how it turns out voting wise. But I think the fact that they uh, were able to um, and did so, did overturn a veto, I normally support. Um, I will say the one thing that I found interesting, it was a uh, very party line split. I think every Republican, correct me if I'm wrong, but every Republican voted in favor of the overturn. Um, and I don't think any of the Democrats did. Um, I would like to see in our country just a little bit less uh, partisanship uh, where, you know, people could actually say, OK, I evaluated it and I'm jumping over the party line here. I would have loved to see a Republican who could have voted, you know, uh, not to overturn it or a Democrat the other way. I would have loved to see the same thing happen, just, you know, a little bit more bipartisanship. Uh, Because I feel like people vote two party line here. And I think this is a perfect example of that. Uh Hi, I'm Nolan Cleary, award winning journalist and host of the hit podcast, Politics Weekly. I'm here to tell you about my new website, NolanCleary.com. It's full of political analyses, a link to my podcast, and predictions for upcoming elections. If you want to know everything there is to know about upcoming elections, go to nolancleary.com right now. All right, so let's move on to the next story. So the Durham report was recently revealed. The report was from John Durham, the U.S. attorney who was hired to investigate the Trump-Russia investigation by Trump when he was still president of the United States. When the Mueller report came out, it found that there was no collusion between Donald Trump and the Russian government. Trump hired Durham to investigate as to whether the Mueller investigation was politically motivated and whether the FBI wrongfully investigated President Trump. President Donald Trump is pointing out that the Durham report does say that the FBI mishandled its investigation of President Donald Trump. What are your thoughts on the initial findings from the Durham report? So I think the investigation was slightly politically motivated. I think the publicization of that investigation was completely politically motivated. Um, I think that if the FBI had wanted to uh, quietly investigate, um, they do quiet investigations all the time where they don't tell people about it. Um, I think government agencies often do that. I mean, there was just um, like with with COVID, there was just a report that came out um, by a government entity. I I think it was FBI um, that said that they think that the virus started from a leak in a lab, right? All of a sudden, people do that. They didn't publicize when they were looking into that. They didn't publicize the fact that they were doing this investigation. They publicized it a lot with Donald Trump. They publicized a lot that there was this possibility. Um, I don't see why we needed a possibility. The truth is, um, 
I don't think there is ever enough evidence where they should have gone public uh, with their investigation. I think that as far as an investigation goes, um, from a non-monetary perspective, we should investigate every possible thing that we can, because why not? I know there's financial uh, costs to it, so that doesn't always work. But I feel like the idea of, okay, there's this possibility, let's investigate it, completely fine. Um, I think that the president is not above investigation. I think that the fact that they wanted to look into it, completely valid. There was never any grounds, though, to continue this conversation. They should have looked at it. There clearly was nothing. There's no more for him than there was proving that the election was rigged, right? We, we, they expected uh, the conservatives slash Republicans to drop the idea that the election was rigged a week after the election results came out. They go, oh, we already started to look into it. It's good. Then after we did more investigations, we're like, how come people are still hung up on this? But they were hung up on Trump's Russia investigation for years while he was in office. People were like, oh, well, you know, this Russia, this thing, Russia, Russia. I'm like, it just doesn't make sense because there's no, there's no uh, indication that Russia helped him. After he got into office, he uh, didn't do anything that specifically stood out as helping Russia. Um, I think uh, Trump was the first president um, since, since Clinton where there wasn't um, a time that Russia came and took over another part of another country. So it's not like they had an incentive to get Trump in so that they could take over the Ukraine without Trump doing anything. Um, it's not like Trump gave Russia any like new technology. There was literally no reason why Russia would have Trump get elected. Now, if they had, and there was proof of it, then I'd be totally fine, uh, you know, admitting why, and then we should investigate why they wanted him in there. But there was never any grounds to begin with. And the investigation, if they want to do it, that's fine. They should keep it to themselves until they find some grounds. And the truth is, uh, the report that came out when they looked at uh, the investigation with Russia, there was nothing. There wasn't like a, oh, we started with this, and then we got an idea that he might, we did more investigating, and it turns out he did it. It was, we decided we wanted to do an investigation and we pulled out Russia and we said, let's see if there's anything here. And it just seems kind of like they took a shot at the dark and a group of people just said, hey, this is a, uh, a wild idea. Let's pursue it. Let's tell people we're pursuing it. And to me, that does seem very politically motivating. So I think just because the report stops at saying it was politically motivated, um, what, I mean, it depends what your definition of politically motivated. Was it motivated by the Democrats to take out Trump? Eh. It's part to poop. Was there a very clear anti-Trump uh, agenda behind the investigation? Absolutely. I absolutely believe there was. Now, I honestly don't think that it was necessarily by the Democratic Party. Um, when Trump got elected, I think both Republicans and Democrats, um, a lot of them on both sides, uh, at least the ones who were influential on both sides, didn't like that he got elected. So it could have been a, a bipartisan effort, but I definitely think there was an anti-Trump agenda. All right. So let's get into the last story. President Joe Biden and the Republicans in the House are trying to negotiate a compromise to avoid the U.S. from defaulting on its debts. There has been some talk about raising the debt ceiling. Some people are against raising the debt ceiling. But right now, both sides are trying to stop a default on debts. What are your thoughts on this negotiation? Well, I think we need to cut spending. The fact of the matter is we have, what is the ceiling right now? It's like 31 something trillion dollars, right? I believe so. Yes. I think so. Regardless, it's, it's 30 something trillion dollars. We are talking about raising that ceiling. There are what? 330 million Americans. These are estimated numbers, but I know they're, they're close, right? So we have. 30, uh, we have $30 trillion of debt for 330 million Americans. And we're talking about increasing that. We already have a problem where, see, people always compare the amount of, um, the amount of debt that we have to the amount of like the GDP that we have. But they're talking about increasing the amount of debt. We have more debt right now than we have average, in, like if we took the average income of Americans, and we multiplied it by the amount of Americans we have, we would have more debt than that. So it's like if Americans had, you know, millions of dollars of debt, and instead of saying, 
oh, we're going to have each person start paying off their debt. We say, no, let's add more debt to it. We've gotten to the point where we're going to have interest rates of the debt eventually surpass the amount that America makes. And at that point, we'll never pay it off. So I feel like when it comes to, you know, like, are we going to default on our debt? I hope not. But I also don't see a way that we can pay off this debt. I think that's why you see places uh, with countries with like BRICS where everyone's saying, hey, let's move away from the American dollar because they're realizing the American dollar isn't sound. The fact of the matter, whether you want to be, you know, supportive of the Democrats, supportive of Biden, hate Biden, love Biden, what, regardless of your political agenda, the fact of the matter is other countries who really could care less about the American political landscape, who really only care about money, right? They're moving away from the dollar. If the dollar was as sound as it was back in the day, people would still be using it. There's a reason that American dollar was used across everywhere because America was the powerhouse. They were the ones who controlled the global economy. If the American economy moved some way, they knew it would affect the entire world. So they picked the country they thought was the most sound economy. In the last you know, several years since COVID, the American economy has not been sound. The debt has gone skyrocketing through the roof. Um, the fact that we ever hit a trillion shocks me. Um, and we've just added way too much debt. Um, you know, that's what happens when you pass bill over bill where they have trillion dollar bills. I mean, there was one of the COVID relief bills. I read it. Um, it was like hundreds of pages. I went through this and I go, there's trillions of dollars here. We're talking trillions. There is no way that anyone listening to the podcast, that anyone in Congress can actually fully wrap their head around the concept of what a trillion dollars is. So I think the fact of the matter is we need to stop increasing the amount of debt we have. We need to try to plateau for a little bit. Um, and this is a, a bit of a hot take. Um, I think the way that the U.S. is going to pay it off is by printing more money and in inflation. Because right now, if our debt's $31 trillion um, and we double the amount of money that's out there, the cost of our debt will be half of that because there will be more money in existence. That will really hurt the American especially older Americans, retired Americans who are going to have to deal with this inflation. The effects, anyone who's older than like 50, and that's not very old either. I want to be very clear. 50 is not old, yet 50 plus, they're going to be very screwed by uh, a large increase in inflation. But I think that's the only way that this will ever get paid off um, unless we decide to default. So the, the question is, what are we going to do? Are we going to have inflation just go through the roof? Or are we going to start cutting our spending? Because we're going to have to own up and realize that people have this idea that the government is like this untouchable entity. But at the end of the day, the government is just like a person. They have to pay off their debt sometime. And the difference is people, uh, governments in theory don't die and humans do. So humans have an expiration date. So we are like, oh, well, you got to pay it off. Otherwise, you pass it on to your kids or what happens? People won't give you more money if they don't think you can give it back. Well, other countries are the ones that are giving us money when we take on debt, right? So they're going to stop giving us money. Eventually, the U.S. is going to hit a point where from an economic standpoint, we are just not the leader. And then we're not just going to be not the leader. As soon as that happens, we're going to have a very nasty economy. And it's to the point where I've already looked at other options for other countries, um, because if this country goes downhill, we could hit not just like a, a recession. We could have uh, a complete, you know, uh, the dollar could, could, could uh, just completely fall um, if the world stopped seeing the dollar as valuable. Um, so I think it's really concerning. I think that's why a lot of people are looking towards like either crypto or bricks or even putting it into like uh, other like the euros, uh, changing their money and just having it in more secure, secure assets. And it's really, really scary that people are seeing the U.S. dollar as not secure. And I think that an increase would be stupid. I think Republicans know that an increase will just uh, be putting a Band-Aid on and they have no incentive to put on a Band-Aid because if they let, uh, you know, us bleed out for a little bit in the long run, it's better for our country. And also the person that will be blamed for it will be Biden. So I think Republicans, if they're smart from a political end, will not allow an increase of the debt ceiling. Um, that said, I think that if they don't, it will really hurt the economy temporarily. And the older people that uh, run these big corporations that back a lot of the politicians, they don't want that. Um, they rather us push back the issue another 10 years um, or 20 years. And for some of these people that, you know, play a big role in politics, the, the truth of the matter is, and I'm not trying to say this in an insulting way, but Biden's not going to be around in 20 years. 
you think he cares about what happens 20 years from now? The people that are going to be screwed are the, the ones in college now, the ones that are 30, 40. Um, so I think it's going to be really interesting to see how it goes. I hope that they don't raise it. Um, if your question is, do I think they will? Um, I think there's a sizable chance because I think at the end of the day, the politicians are doing what uh, special interests want and special interests want us to increase that debt ceiling um, to push back the uh, the issue to the younger generation. Um, but I think it's it's a major issue and uh, I'm not looking forward to seeing an uh, increase. And I'm very much interested to see what happens if they don't increase that, that debt limit. Um, how will this recession ha hit? Because people are like, oh, we're already in the recession or we're going to be out of the recession or we're not in a recession. All of that is going to be clear when this when this hits. You know, it's just going to um, it's going to really hurt the economy. So I think the the solution for them will be to print more money, which will make inflation go higher, which will decrease uh, by its chance of getting elected. But I think that it's the only way they're going to pay off the debt. All right. Well, Zion, Sharon, thank you again for joining me before you leave. Do you want to tell people where you can be found on social media? Sure. So I have um, a personal social media, but um, as far as the one that I have, and I don't have a huge following, um, I don't mind it that way. Um, I find that, you know, more people sometimes is, is not a good thing. But if you enjoyed this, I can be found at Zion in politics. Um, it's uh, on Instagram. And I'm looking at making a, uh, a, uh, a podcast or a uh, video series. And uh, that will be uh, Desi on the mic. Um, D-E-Z-I on the mic. Um, that's the nickname of mine, Desi. So um, that's something that hopefully I'll have uh, in the near future. I'm looking to set that up this summer. All right. Thank you again, Zion, for joining me. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this and uh, appreciate you doing this podcast. I think it's really important. And I've always thought that you've done great work. Thank Hello, and welcome to Presidential Profiles 2024. Today we will be discussing Tim Scott, the Republican candidate for president. Scott was born in 1965. Upon growing up, he went to Presbyterian College and graduated with a political science major. He owned an insurance agency titled Tim Scott Allstate. In 1995, he was elected to the North Charleston City Council. A year later, he ran for state senate but was defeated by incumbent Robert Ford, he was re-elected to the city council in 2000 and 2004. During his time, he posted a King James version of the Ten Commandments on his office door and was sued by the ACLU and lost the lawsuit. In 2008, he ran South Carolina State House and won. In 2010, he ran for U.S. House. He ran against Strom Thurmond's son, but won the primary and the general. He was re-elected in 2012. In 2013, South Carolina U.S. Senator Jim DeMint resigned from office. Then-Governor Nikki Haley appointed Scott to the U.S. Senate. Scott was re-elected in 2014, 2016, and 2022. Scott was an ally of Trump, but opposed him sometimes. Now he runs for president. Thank you for watching Presidential Profiles 2024. Listen to Politics Weekly every Tuesday wherever you listen to podcasts and subscribe to the NolanCleary.com YouTube channel and hit that notification bell.